Hello everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay, and hopefully you are seeing my screen right now. I am going to apologize because if uh, you may be able to tell in my voice, I am currently a little bit sick. Uh, so I'm going to spare you the sight of having to look at me. I am actually at home today. Uh, and I'm going to do my absolute best to mute myself every time I have to cough, but I apologize if I cough in your ear at some point during this uh, during this webinar today. So, uh, my name is Brad Zdenek. I am the Innovation Strategist with the Center for Online Innovation and Learning, as well as the EdTech Network here at Penn State. Uh, I have been running the COIL uh, Research Initiation Grant process for the last eight cycles, uh, four years, uh, and and have been the one uh, primarily tasked with uh, with consulting with each one of the proposers as they think about going down this path of talking to our reviewers and helping put together this wonderful community we've built, uh, and in helping making the decisions as to which ones of the proposals we, we fund each year. Uh, so. I want to start off by saying thank you to each and every one of you. Uh, this is a process that simply could not run without our wonderful reviewer committee. Uh, we have each each round, we have roughly 70 individuals, seven zero individuals twice a year uh, who give up their time to read these proposals, give thoughtful feedback, uh, rate and review them, come to the reviewer meetings. Uh, it, it is a dedication of your time and expertise which is deeply, deeply appreciated uh, by me and by our entire team. So I want to start off by, by giving that thank you uh, because if it weren't for you, your expertise, uh, your time, your insights, this process simply wouldn't work. Uh, we, we are uh, quite proud of the fact that Every single individual who submits for a COIL rig, whether they are funded or not, walks away from this process with five to ten pages of insightful feedback from our reviewer committees uh, to help them in the future for their idea, whether it's with a COIL rig or whether they go on to other funding agencies. Uh, we have had uh, many examples of individuals who have submitted for a rig had poor fits with our particular criteria uh, and have walked away from our process with the feedback and sometimes some new collaborations, refined their approach, refined their idea, submitted it and gotten much larger grants through uh, NIH, NSF, IES, all examples of some ideas that have gone on to, to wonderful funding without even securing the rig funding. Uh, and again, it's the it's the uh, feedback and the insights that you provide that allow that to happen. So thank you. Uh, you're going to hear that from me a number of times, uh, both today and through the emails that will follow this. Uh, but that appreciation is deep and sincere. So what we're going to do today is I, um, run gun. I don't know. No one else seems to be mentioning the lack of audio. Uh, Rungan, if you click on your uh, speaker up at the top, that might be the issue. Worst case scenario, may need to drop out and come back in. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. So what we're going to do today is we are going to basically walk through this process. Uh, I am going to help walk you through exactly what you're going to do. And my intent is to have you go into this process without an ounce of fear or uh, hesitation as to what's going to be happening and how it will work. Uh, and to allay any fears that you may have, uh, if you, particularly if you have not uh, conducted many reviews before for grant processes. Uh, for those of you who are old hands, and I see a few of you on the list, uh, this is mostly going to be a recap for you and uh, I'll, I'll allow uh, you the opportunity to ask some questions that may have come up in some of the changes that we've made over the last few rounds. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to uh, start by walking you through the, the RFP, the re request for proposals, so you can see what the proposers saw, uh, the individuals that wrote the proposals that you'll be reading, what they saw, and the context for wh through which they, uh, they view the rigs. Then we're going to go into the shared space that we will have, which is a shared box folder that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Uh, we'll walk through the materials that are available in there. 
and then we will apply those materials that we go through at, by doing a, a mock review uh, for a proposal. And I'll walk you through the online tool that we will be using and you can see beginning to end how it will work for you. So as we're going along, if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, feel free to type them into the chat box there. Obviously, I will be keeping an eye on that and I'll respond as I can. Um, a little bit of context is probably helpful. Uh, we're going to start on the COIL website here. You should be seeing coil.psu.edu. And under the COIL website, there is a tab, Grants. And you can look for the call for rig proposals. Now, this page is our RFP, our request for proposals. Uh, this is what we put out and, and advertised for individuals to submit their grants into this process. A little bit of context is important. The rigs, if you're not familiar with them, the rigs are $40,000, up to $40,000 seed grants that are intended to support the uh, initial exploration of innovations that can help improve learning, both here at Penn State and beyond. Uh, and in fact, and beyond is very important, uh, as you'll see in the criteria a little bit later. The rigs are, uh, the rig money comes out of a portion of the revenue from World Campus. It is an opportunity for World Campus to reinvest in uh, the university and in the, uh, in the innovations that are happening related to learning in the university. But you will notice if you read through any of these materials that nowhere in here does it specifically say that these grants are related to online learning. These are for online innovations in learning, which is slightly different. Uh, online learning is a, uh, is a smaller subset than the online innovations. So in other words, within these, this grant process, proposers can come up with ideas that may not have uh, direct or exclusive uh, applications in an online learning environment, for instance, World Campus, but may have applications for residential or hybrid or mixed or flipped or whichever terminology you'd like to use in whatever paradigm you're working within. So the idea here is that you should not dismiss out of hand any proposal that does not directly apply and only apply to online learning. That said, online innovations means that it's some sort of networked technology that's being utilized. It's some sort of ed tech, if you will, in a broadest term. It's some sort of ed tech that's being applied and very often those applications go beyond a residential classroom, go beyond just the flipped or hybrid, and have applications within an online context as well. But it, uh, I wanted to dismiss that confusion right off because we have had some reviewers confused in the past thinking uh, as they read a proposal, this, this, this isn't online learning. Uh, this this is, only applies for residential. That's okay. Uh, as long as it's using some sort of uh, online or uh, networked technology related to it. And that could include things such as mobile telepresence robots is one example. Uh, is so, uh, a pr example from this context to one of the proposals this time around uh, has to do with research related to using mo mobile telepresence robots. So uh, this RFP uh, gives that example, that overview of what the rigs are talks about eligibility, you don't have to worry too much about that. Talks about the deadline, that is passed, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, funding, it may be useful for you to look through uh, the potential use of funds, uh, what is allowed and what is not. But again, this is not where we are relying upon your expertise. I will be looking at these budgets, I will be uh, contacting the principal investigators, PIs from now on, uh, I'll be contacting the PIs related to any sort of issues uh, related to the use of funds and the like. But it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be beneficial for you to be able to keep an eye out for this and know the context of where money can be used for these grants. You can see it both here in the live web version and in the box folder I'll be showing you a little bit later. There's a PDF version that you can download and look at, a uh, PDF version of this RFP. Uh, so you can always have it on hand. So we talk about the use of funds, and you can use the funds for everything from uh, personnel to buying equipment to uh, travel uh, to wage for bringing in some, some wage dollars, uh, graduate assistantships, uh, bringing in collaborators from other universities. All of those are perfectly acceptable uses of, of funding. 
we have certain funding priorities and we'll get to these two in a minute which is personalization and student retention those are our research priorities for this year and we'll talk about those when we get into the criteria and then the funding guidelines uh, individuals may ask for up to forty thousand dollars it is expected that this round we will fund two to three proposals we received <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that, I was trying to hold that one in. Uh, we received 18 proposals. We are expecting that we will fund two to three. Uh, so you can see this is going to be a very competitive process, and you can see why your insights and your help in this is, is critical. $40,000 is a maximum ask. Uh, we will be funding uh, just short of $120,000 uh, uh, in grants this time around, this, this round. Uh, so you can see, depending on what the ask is, uh, we may be able to fit three in as long as they're slightly under $40,000, uh, but definitely two. So here is the proposal, and this is the last thing we're going to look at on the RFP page, uh, but sometimes it's very helpful for you to understand what it is you're going to be looking at uh, before, it's actually, before you actually open it up, what the proposals are, the way they're structured. You will also notice on the left-hand side of the wrapper for this webinar session, uh, I have the proposal sections written out there as well. Uh, but we'll look at them here on the website as, as the proposer saw them. The first thing is a cover page. You don't have to worry about too much about this, uh, but you can look at it to get a quick glimpse of who's on the team uh, and where they're from uh, and how large the team is, as well as some background information, how much they're asking for, and the name of the project and the like. What I will point out here is that uh, tomorrow you will receive an email from me with your assignments. Each reviewer will be assigned four proposals to review. If for some reason you can't do four, please just email me and let me know and I will assign you fewer. Uh, but you will be assigned without, uh, with any, uh, without any sort of request for less, you will be assigned four proposals. I will do my best to make certain that there are no conflicts of interest between you and the individuals on the team uh, for the proposals you are assigned. That said, this is an amazingly small community. When you think of a place like Penn State, you think you know uh, that that we're, we're large and monolithic, and and it would be no problem identifying uh, individuals to do reviews with no conflicts of interest. But when you get into this ed tech space, when you get into this innovation space, when you get into this online learning space, you start to find that a lot of us know each other and work with one another. Both those inside this university and those of you who are external reviewers, uh, but have some sort of linkage with Penn State. So with that said, if you identify any sort of conflict of interest, and I'll define that in a second, if you identify any sort of conflict of interest that I missed, please simply reach out to me with an email or a text or a, a phone call and let me know that and I can rearrange the assignments. And what happens there is when there's a personal contact, an individual is your neighbor, uh, something that I would not necessarily be able to identify or know, uh, those are the things that, that can slip by. As well, sometimes we all are working on uh, multidisciplinary projects around the university where you may be working directly with someone and you just would not be comfortable with reviewing their proposal uh, given the closeness of your relationship. That said, simply knowing an individual or having worked with them in the past does not necessarily mean that you have a conflict of interest. And I will not expect you to recuse yourself from a uh, review simply because you know somebody that's on the team. Uh, if that were our uh, if if that were our metric, then quite honestly, it would be almost impossible for me to to assign all of these reviews uh, because so many of us know one another. So the 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 question here is within your discretion, if you feel that you cannot or do not want to review a proposal based on who the principal investigator or the team is, just let me know. I never want you to conduct a review that you don't feel comfortable with. Uh, and no questions asked, I'll simply reassign. So we'll leave it at that. That cover page has all that information, who's on the team. Uh, and then we move into these 200 word sections. And, and you'll notice some parallels between these and the criteria when we get to the criteria. 
The first one is the abstract. This gives you the nice 200 words succinct, what is this project? What is this thing uh, that's being proposed? After that, there is an innovation statement. And we'll spend a little bit of time on this in a little bit about what that is and how you should be reading it. But the innovation statement is a 200 word section of what is the innovation? It's the elevator pitch of the innovation here. Not necessarily the project, but what is new and novel about this thing? And we'll, like I said, we'll do a deep dive on that in a little bit. I, I, on, as an aside here, this innovation statement, when I do my consultations for uh, proposers, individuals who are looking at submitting a proposal, uh, this is where we spend most of our time because this is the section that can often make or break a proposal. And you'll see that as you start to read through these and you get a little bit more experience with these, that the innovation statement can color the way you look at the rest of the proposal. And if an individual is able to make a solid case for what is innovative about what they're doing, they often are on a solid footing for the rest of their proposal. Uh, like I said, you'll see that as it plays out in the proposals you read. Impact on learning. This is a 200 uh, word section of essentially how does this project impact learning or how can it impact learning down the road. You'll see that directly tied to a criteria a little bit later on. Alignment with COIL's research priorities. I just mentioned these. This is the personalization and student retention. And the question here is how does this proposal intersect with those goals, those research priorities. Uh, these are two very big buckets, personalization, student retention. Uh, quite honestly, most things in this uh, online innovation space uh, related to learning can fall into one of these two buckets, so it's not too difficult of an argument to make, uh, but they still need to make that argument within uh, 200 words in this section. Now, all of those are very limited uh, places to, to, to write out the thoughts, to, to uh, explain what they're planning to do, and that it's that way intentionally. But in this next section, this is where they have their space to really do a deep dive, or, or a deeper dive, I should say, a deeper dive into what the plan is, what their project is, and how they're planning on doing it. This is a five-page narrative. Uh, this is double-spaced, 12-point font. I should point out at this point, you also do not do not have to concern yourself with the 200-word limitations in those sections above. I will do that for you in advance. And uh, if anything is over 200 words, I'll send it back to the proposer uh, for modifications before sending it out to you. Uh, and in this section, same thing with the five pages double space. Don't worry about that. I will take care of it in advance. Just worry about the content. But within this narrative, they have the opportunity to describe what, is, what it is they're planning to do in greater detail, as well as to talk about the significance, uh, flesh out their research or evaluation plan, uh, talk about what their timeline is for the study, uh, as well as to flesh out what are their opportunities for funding down, down the road. As I described these, these research initiation grants are seed grants, uh, $40,000 to get a project off the ground. What we don't want is to put $40,000 into something that has no life beyond uh, the course of this grant. We want these to go on to much larger grants, and we've had great success in that. Uh, in fact, this program has brought in over $4 million in external research grant money to this university. Uh, and that's the idea here, is we want to prioritize those projects that have a good chance of bringing in some external funding and or having a life beyond uh, this 18 months of the grant that we are funding. Uh, I should point that out. These grants are, are expected to be roughly 12-month projects. Uh, they have the money for 18 months, and that allows a little bit of administrative front end and administrative back end on the projects. Uh, but the projects will mostly be those things that can be completed within a 12-month period. So that's the narrative, and again, you can read those bullet points. I don't need to read those to you. Uh, the next section you're going to run across are the references. It's a one-page reference section. Uh, they may or may not have much there. Uh, again, these are five-page narratives. So there's not much space to do a uh, deep literature review or the like, but you will find some references there that may be of interest to you as you're reviewing the, the proposals. The team bios. This is a section that does not have a limitation in pages or words. 
uh, this is the opportunity for the team to convince you that they are able to do what they just described in the narrative. I have highly encouraged everyone that I've talked to that has proposed to make these bios succinct and relevant to the project they're proposing, but that is not always the case. Uh, you will run across some where these team bios are two pages per person uh, with large academic bios that have very little to do with the, the project at hand. Um, that is something that you can simply skim, uh, look through, make certain that you can tick off the boxes of them being able to do what they propose and ignore some of the rest of what they include. Uh, sometimes we have difficulty moving outside of traditional academic grant writing uh, where these larger bios are, are often awarded, particularly with automated review processes. Uh, so again, you will have to forgive some of the teams with the size of the bio uh, sections that they put in. After the bios, you'll see an estimated budget. Uh, most of these, all but one of these, will look identical. Uh, and that is because they will be images or screenshots from what is called the Penn State SIMS tool, which is a finance budgeting tool that we use here at the university. There is one project that comes from Penn College. Penn College flies under the Penn State banner, but they have their own independent systems uh, that they use for their human resources and their finance offices. So they do not have a SIMS tool to use. They were uh, allowed to use their own tool for their proposal and I will send a letter out if, to those individuals who are assigned that proposal. I'll send a letter out to remind you of that. But for all the rest, you'll have this nice uh, line item breakdown, almost a spreadsheet of each one of the costs that is within this grant. Those can add up to anything short of $40,000, $40,000 being the max. Along with that spreadsheet will be a budget narrative that will immediately follow that SIMS printout. And that will allow the proposers an opportunity to write out a narrative structure what each one of those line items uh, refers to, what it is. Uh, so if they list certain conferences for travel, well, this is their opportunity for explaining why they would want to go to that conference. Uh, if they have personnel hours, this would be the place where they write in why they're using those personnel hours or why that person is being paid what they are, whatever the case may be. So there will be a budget narrative that goes along with that. Next is dissemination plan. This is a maximum of one page. It is a specific criteria. It's a three-point criteria we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, and this is just the, uh, the place where they will be describing how they're going to let others know about their work. Dissemination can happen early on in the project, can happen in the middle, can happen once everything is wrapped up, but still within the 18 months. In general, most dissemination efforts happen toward the end. Uh, I will tell you that this is a great place for proposers to include opportunities for dissemination, such as the TLT Symposium, which is a conference that we hold here at the university once a year, uh, held by Teaching Learning with Technology. Uh, it is an excellent opportunity for dissemination, and I highly encourage proposers to include that. That is something you may want to look for. Did they think about those types of opportunities, those homegrown opportunities for dissemination, and include them? And that's something you could include in the comments as feedback if they did not. Uh, same goes for our COIL conversation series. If you're familiar with those, those are one-hour webinars we run uh, highlighting innovative work at the university. That's another great avenue for dissemination that they may or may not have included, uh, but you should keep an eye out for. Letters of support. Uh, this is something new. If you, a uh, few of you were not reviewers this past round, but have been before that, these were uh, only instituted in this last round uh, in the fall. There are two letters of support, one for from Human Resources Office and one from Finance Office. Uh, there is an expectation for two letters, uh, one of each of those from the PI's department or college. And the reason for this is we've had some trouble in the past with individuals writing proposals, uh, grant proposals for us, and not letting their finance or HR departments know. Uh, and then their finance or HR departments are surprised by the fact that there's some hiring that gets triggered uh, 
as well as some need for support with processing payments, access to P cards, uh, things of that sort. So in order to, to prevent that, we ask for these letters of support. You should see them in the proposals. There's no criteria related to this that you will be scoring. Keep an eye out for it. I will also be checking that uh, when I review the proposals. And then finally, supporting materials. So I have to warn you here. Uh, the supporting materials section is not limited. Uh, it is wide open. And it's basically anything else that can't fit in that five-page narrative that would be relevant and useful for you to judge or deem whether or not these projects should be funded. That is taken in very different ways by very different people. Uh, we have had in the past an individual who copied their entire dissertation to the end as supporting material related to the project. Uh, so it was 100 plus pages tacked on to the end as supporting material. Uh, generally, the best use of this is putting in uh, photos, images, screenshots if a tool is being built. Uh, maybe survey materials if there's some sort of survey being conducted so you can see the questions. Things that just wouldn't fit in the five pages, or wouldn't be best uh, inserted in the five pages, they can be put at the end. But you will notice, the way it is written in the RFP, I caution them, be judicious in what you include in this section. You, the reviewers, are not required to read through all of this material. That said, I encourage you to spend a little bit of time on them and look at it. If they included it, hopefully they included that material for a reason and that it will add uh, to your understanding what the project is. But do not feel that you have to read that word for word. If it is a tremendous amount of material, feel free to flip through it and skim through it. Uh, you are under no obligation to read that. The, the bulk of these proposals are within about seven pages, that five-page narrative and then the few pages of extra materials on either end, the budget and the like. For the most part, we try to keep them that short so that they are succinct, they are to the point, and they don't cause an undue burden on you as our reviewers who are donating your time. Uh, so, again, for these extra materials at the end, glance through them, take a look at them, but do not feel an obligation to read them word for word if not necessary. I do usually encourage proposers to include things like YouTube links if there are relevant YouTube links to, uh, to video samples of their project or their thing they're building. Uh, so that may be in these extra materials and those are usually very beneficial to look at. So again, look through, see what you can see and go from there. The rest of what's in the RFP are the criteria for project selection. And uh, just so you know they're here, uh, we're going to go through them in a different format, but this is what the proposer saw. The exact criteria and point values that I am going to be showing to you now. Uh, so we are as transparent as we can be in this process uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, this, is, this is Penn State money for Penn State people. We want to help each other here. It's a little different than most grant processes. Uh, our, our goal is to help one another uh, advance the field of, uh, of, uh, of online learning, of advance the field of teaching and learning here at the university, and advance our university and what we're able to offer students to improve the student experience. Uh, so we, we try to help both the reviewers and the proposers as much as we can in making this the, uh, as transparent as possible. So along those lines, this is where you're going to be spending most of your time. This is a box folder. You will receive a link to this in your materials tomorrow. Uh, it will be in an email. And uh, I'm also going to uh, type it here. And that is coil rig. This is a, uh, a box folder. It is password protected. The password is coil rig. Again, that material will be sent to you in an email tomorrow. But when you go there, you will have access to all the materials necessary for conducting your reviews. The first and arguably most important is this first subfolder here, which says proposals. When you click on that, you will see all 18 of the proposals that were submitted this round. 
each one has a prefix letter and then the na last name of the of the principal investigator and that is how we will be referring to each one of these uh, throughout the round um, I should say each on these proposals uh, you can look at them in two different ways in box if you just simply click on them uh, it will give you a preview of the of the PDF so you can read it there but I find it much more useful to click on the three dots here and then click on download and when you receive your review assignments tomorrow you can go in and download the proposals you've been assigned now some of you are overachievers and will really enjoy this process and will love reading these proposals uh, and learning about the some of the innovative ideas and you will not be happy stopping at your four that is fine and I get this request each each time a number of proposals I'm sorry a number of reviewers ask hey can I review a couple extra proposals yes in short yes you may uh, we'd really deeply appreciate that it by no means is it expected or required uh, but if you want to review extra proposals you may uh, what we ask is that if there are any uh, if there are any submissions that you read that you feel there's a conflict of interest then we ask that you that you uh, you refrain from from reading commenting on those uh, otherwise you can review as many of these as you would like uh, your four will be assigned to you but above and beyond that you have access to every proposal in this folder these links will go dead the day after uh, our reviewer meeting so that'll be June 3rd uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit so those are all the proposals you can download those or you can look at them in the thin box and they're all in the proposals folder the remainder of this folder uh, is numbered one two three four five six seven and this is basically the step-by-step -step walkthrough for you and how to do this entire process step one is the RFP the PDF of the RFP that we just walked through uh, so we don't need to go through that again but if you want to download it and look at it it's available to you there Number two, how to conduct and submit reviews. This is basically a written version of everything we're talking about right now. Uh, just written down in a nice bullet uh, list uh, of what you can do with all the links incorporated. And you will see we've already walked through a number of these steps. Here's the box link where, that I just gave you and the password. If you, I told you you get an email tomorrow. If you don't get that email assignment, uh, I ask you to email me talk about the conflicts of interest here's a proposals folder we just talked about and we're going to start talking about now the rig review rubric which is in the box folder and this is the thing you're going to be using for actually conducting your review so if you look through here's your how to conduct submit reviews uh, this is a checklist this just has all the different sections of the proposal for your reference uh, you don't really have to worry about that but this is uh, the big one the rig review rubric and if you click and open up open that up you will see uh, what you may recognize as as a traditional uh, evaluative uh, rubric so this has a breakdown of each one of the criteria that I referenced a little bit earlier in that RFP and more importantly it provides you with some guidance for thinking through how to assign point values related to each one of those criteria we're going to spend a little bit of time right now on a few of these criteria talking about what they are how to think about them and questions that may come up related to these criteria so the first one is innovation and this is one we're going to spend a few minutes because innovation is probably the most common sticking point or point of disagreement amongst our reviewers while conducting these reviews we have refined our definition of innovation uh, as we've gone along and we have done that very intentionally to limit the leeway in defining de uh, defining innovation amongst our reviewers and amongst ourselves uh, just a key point this is something that the coil directors disagree on significantly on a regular basis uh, so this is not simply trying to get uh, reviewers on the same page that we're on we're often on different pages uh, and that's where this definition has helped us uh, rein that in a little bit so our definition is this I'm going to read it because we've crafted this innovation is a research development or introduction of something new or novel 
highlight that new or novel, be it an idea, device, or approach with the intent of improving learning. Now under that, I give you a couple bullet points to help you think through whether or not this thing is an innovation by our definition. So the first thing is, is it new or novel? Uh, and, okay, new or novel, that's all well and good, that's fine, but what does that mean? Uh, can we break that down anymore? Okay, let's break it down a little bit more. The second bullet point says that it is an... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I didn't get to my uh, mute button fast enough on that one. Uh, that an innovation is not a refinement on an existing process, technology, or approach. This one's tricky, and, and this is where we're going to rely a little bit on your discretion and your expertise, in that there is a certain point at which the refinements on something become such that it is wholly new, that it is innovative at that point. Uh, so an example may be, uh, we could look at something like the iPhone. Uh, there had been portable computing devices with call functionality in them before. I had a Dell X51V, this wonderful little pocket computer uh, that I could call from and do a number of things with. But it wasn't adopted on mass scales because it lacked a lot of functionality and it lacked a lot of the user experience. Apple came in and provided a number of different additions to it, refinements on what that initial tool had offered. Uh, had buttoned up a number of the processes, had made the user experience much better, had added a number of different refinements. And in the end, what they ended up with was something that was wholly new and novel. The refinements added up to that point where it was new. An example of something that is not. We had a proposal not too long ago in which an individual was going to uh, essentially modify the uh, the forum spaces, the, the chat spaces within our learning management system. Uh, they were dissatisfied with the way that individuals were able to chat with one another and were particularly dissatisfied with the threaded nature of those discussions and was going to add a few extra levels of nesting to those conversations. That was really it. They were refining they were uh, adding a little bit more functionality to something that existed. But it was not such that it made it something wholly new or novel. It was just a little bit better version of what was already there. And by that measure, it was not an innovation by our, de by our definition. It was a refinement on an existing uh, technology or an existing approach. Uh, and even within that case, it was not new in that other in other platforms already implemented uh, those refinements. Uh, so novel is this idea that, to your question, Jerry, novel is this idea that it is uh, a unique assemblage of things, uh, that it is unique mm -hmm. in the way that things are put together. But any one of those pieces may not be wholly new. Uh, they may be things that are in, uh, in existence, but putting them together in the particular way they put, are being put together makes them novel. New, however, is something that is wholly new. It's a functionality that does not currently exist, or at least does not exist in any sort of implementation. Uh, in other words, there may be a university somewhere uh, where there's a faculty member that's also researching this thing or creating this thing, uh, but it, it is definitely not on the market yet. It is definitely not broadly adopted. It is definitely uh, not uh, familiar for most people. Those would be new. One other point on this is that a proposal, an innovative proposal, is not something that is applying an approach, existing approach to a new context. Let me give you an example again here. In the past, we had a wonderful proposal from the College of Nursing that was looking at applying just-in-time mentoring to a nursing training program. So the idea here was that there was going to be video conferencing technologies put in place that uh, during the course of study or interactions with patients within the course of study for nurses, that they would be able to get immediate feedback and observation from uh, more senior individuals, mentors. Uh, within the nursing field, from what they told us, being the experts in, in nursing, uh, within the nursing field, when they proposed this uh, four years ago, 
this was wholly new. This was not something that was done. Uh, some of it due to security concerns and patient confidentiality, but they had a way of doing this that, that satisfied those needs. But our issue was that within the field of education in particular, just-in-time mentoring is a well-tread territory. It is something that has been heavily researched, that has a robust research base and publication base around it. We know quite about a bit about just-in-time mentoring. They were taking something that was already existing and applying it to a new context, nursing. That was not innovative by our definition, and so fell outside of the scope of funding for us. And this is one we struggled over. In fact, that's uh, it was the impetus for this, this other bullet point here uh, about uh, a new context. So again, this does not answer every question that's going to come up. You're still going to struggle a little bit with the innovation, but this should point you in a direction. This should help clear up some of your thinking about innovation. And then we break it down a little bit throughout the rubric here so that you can see uh, what would be a zero point uh, on or zero points on innovation. What would be one point on innovation? What would be two, three, four, or five? Uh, this is a total 10 point section, but you will see we only break it down into five and then we say there's a multiplier of two. So in other words, if you gave it five, it would be 10 points. Four, eight, three, six, two, four, one, two, zero, zero. Uh, so break down there. And the reason for this is that we know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we knew, know through uh, through best practices and research that humans are not uh, able to reliably discern between more than five points of differentiation on most scales, on most Likert scales. So we try to keep it within the five. You will have more availability for scoring within the tool itself, but on the rubric we try to narrow it down to these five. And you'll see the differences are, are, are basically a combination of whether or not the innovation is directly stated or whether it's inferred and whether or not there's uh, sufficient evidence to back up any sort of statement of innovation. And you can see where this that 200 word innovation section up front becomes very important. This is a 10 point section. Most funding decisions are made on splits of two or three points between proposals. You can see how this 10 point section can be very, very important. So that's innovation. Uh, and again, you can read through this and, and familiarize with yourself with this. I re highly recommend printing this off and having it sitting next to you when you're reading your proposals uh, so you can reference back to it unless you've done this a number of times and you're familiar with this rubric, uh, which you will become familiar very quickly. Second criteria is enhancing learning. This is basically just a question of can this thing that's being proposed improve learning? Uh, it, does it have the potential for long-term impact? Uh, is it of interest for online learning specifically? I already told you that this doesn't have to be online learning, but it is a lens we have. And so one of the questions for enhancing learning is, does, does it have uh, application here? If it only applies to residential, then it will have a lower score on this enhancing learning criteria than it may otherwise have. Uh, if, however, it is applicable in online and residential, well, that's a higher score. Uh, that, that's more applicable, can impact more individuals, and can uh, impact more uh, classes and courses and students here at the university. Uh, you will notice that is also a 10-point section, a multiplier 2, 5 points times 2. Next, alignment with COIL themes of personalization, student retention. Again, a 10-point section, and basically the question is, does this impact personalization or student retention? You will notice, here is the first 200-word section we looked at. This is the second 200-word section we looked at. Here's the third 200-word section we, we looked at. They're directly in alignment with the recommended breakdown of the uh, proposal and what should be there. Next, is the R&D team well prepared to execute the project? Basically, this means, can this team do it? Uh, if you have a team of three freshmen uh, and they are going to be putting something together that is going to impact the entire university and is very complex, I'd have some questions. Uh, however, uh, in the same, uh, on the same hand, if you have one senior faculty member uh, on the team and uh, no instructional designers, no learning designers, no students, and it has something to do with, uh, with instruction directly, that would raise some questions as well. 
or if it is a faculty member in, say, a college that does not uh, is not directly aligned with with learning and education, should they perhaps have somebody from the College of Education in there? Can the team do what they say they're going to do? This is a five-point section. You'll see multiplier one. Applicability uh, basically is this is can this apply anywhere outside the context of this particular project? So in other words. 18 months after the funding is given, can this project do more than apply to just that one class or course or section at which it was applied? Or also, can this have application outside of Penn State? Uh, we're, we're not limited to thinking about improving Penn State here. We're looking at improving learning across all institutions. So does this have potential for impact outside of Penn State? Again, a five-point section here. Cost effectiveness. We are stewards of public money. Uh, as I said, this is funded by revenue from World Campus. That revenue comes directly from students and their tuition dollars. We must be good stewards of this money. And so cost effectiveness is important to us. Is the money being spent well? Is it being, uh, is it being wasted in any particular way? And so we ask you to look at the budget and see, it, are, the, are the expenditures reasonable? Uh, and are they reasonable given the potential impact of the project? Uh, so if the entire project is going to impact three students and it's going to cost $40,000, I will compare that to another project that's going to, uh, to impact an entire college worth of students and also cost $40,000. Uh, to me, it's more cost effective to, to fund the latter. This is a seven-point section. You'll see the multiplier is 1.4. Uh, is a seven-point section. Feasibility, uh, can it be done in the timeline? So you could have a great team, but you can still bite off more than you can chew. So the team may be capable of doing the project, but simply given the $40,000 and or the time frame, it simply can't be done. Or the project relies upon access to data that is simply not going to be made available, uh, whether it be through FERPA concerns or whatever it may be. Uh, sometimes projects are torpedoed by the fact that they need data that they simply can't get, and they definitely can't get within 18 months. Uh, sometimes the approval processes for access to certain data sets can be a year, 18 months in, uh, themselves. Uh, so that all feeds into the feasibility. Research evaluation plan. These are research initiation grants, so there will be a research plan that's included. Uh, it is not too terribly in-depth. Uh, this is a five-page proposal, so there's not much room to, to do much more uh, than, than just give a, a broad swath of the methodology. But this is a research plan. It's a 10-point section again. Potential to generate subsequent research and funding. Again, uh, five points, and this is can it bring in extra money or does it have a life beyond the 18 months? These are seed grants. We want to make sure something grows up out of them. And finally, dissemination plan. Dissemination plan is how are you going to tell people about this project? You will notice this is a three-point section with only three points uh, distributed there. So that's the rubric that you will use for, for doing this, for uh, conducting your reviews. You will also have this worksheet. Some of you will prefer to enter your scores directly into the online tool. Uh, you will eventually have to, to insert your scores into the online tool before you're done. But some of you may want to use this worksheet and jot them down on the worksheet beforehand. If you want to, you've got them here. You do not need to use this, and you definitely do not need to give these to me if you do use them. Uh, you can just toss them out once you're done. Uh, but this is just a, a, another tool for you to use uh, to be helpful. So now we've gone through number five, the review worksheet. Number six, how will your data be used? Uh, basically, I will uh, just tell you that there is only one person in this entire university that will know which reviewer gave what score and what comment, and that will be me. Uh, I have to know it in order for me to be able to do the data analysis and to check for errors, but no one else will have access to this information. I will send all the scores back out to all the reviewers, but they will be completely anonymized. Uh, so no one will be able to figure out who you are. I won't even tell you who, which number you are. You'll have to figure it out yourself or contact me directly to get your, uh, your number. So uh, that's how your data will be used. And 
you can read through the full description by clicking on that. And then finally, there's the link to review proposals. Here it is. When you click on this, you will come into this form right here. And this is where you will apply everything we just talked about. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and I'm going to find myself under Reviewer. Please make certain that you click the correct name. Uh, so if there is an error or a problem, I know who, uh, who it goes to. Uh, so I clicked myself. And then I will look through and I will find the proposal that I'm re reviewing. In this case, I'm doing Test. And I'll click the Forward button. This should look familiar. Innovation. Here's our criteria. Here's all the bullet points that we've provided in a couple different places. And then here is your slider to assign a score. So you will notice, as I said, in the rubric, you are limited with the 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. In the tool itself, you can do any number you want. So if you truly feel like you know the difference between a 9 and an 8, or a 7 and a 5, or a 7 and a 6, you can do that here. Uh, I would encourage you to try to stick with what the rubric has, but by no means are you, by, uh, are you required to do so. I would highly encourage you, please, 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 to write very insightful comments uh, in these sections, uh, in the comment section. And the reason being is that whether or not these projects are funded, they are going to get all of these comments sent back to them. And it will allow them to refine their proposal for either the next round of rigs or for the next grant they go after. This information is, is so important for our proposers. In fact, some propose knowing that they're not quite there yet, but they need help and they need this sort of feedback and they submit to the rigs to get this feedback in order to prepare themselves for the next round. So if particularly if you give a very high score or a very low score, please make certain you, in, you incorporate comments for each one of the uh, criteria. Once I do that, I click forward and then I will see all of my criteria. And I will have the opportunity to type in my comments and go on through. And you'll see the criteria, the point value. I set it. And I'll walk us through all these real quick so you can see what comes at the end. Applicability, we talked about that. Cost effectiveness, was that a good use of the money? Feasibility, can it be done with the time and resources allocated? Research plan, do the research questions align with what they're doing? subsequent research, and then dissemination plan. Now, you will notice that this was our last of the criteria, the three criteria. When I go on to the next one, there's one thing that we didn't mention yet, and this is called making connections. In the same vein of what we've been talking about with this being a tool to help proposers whether or not they're funded, this is a place for you to let the proposers know who maybe they should be talking to that they have not uh, included in their proposal. So is there a faculty member at the university that you know uh, that is working in this space already and that the individual should make contact with? This is a place that you would put it. And again, this will be shared directly with them. Uh, so Ryan, to your question, do they receive every single comment? They received every single comment. Uh, I do go through and I read just in case there are any inappropriate comments or things that we wouldn't want to share, uh, but it is an intentional decision of ours that we send everything th through to the proposer and it is not filtered by us. Uh, in many grant processes, an individual would go through and would uh, summarize the comments. We do not do that, uh, again, intentionally. We give them everything. And Jerry, yes, uh, contacts outside of Penn State would be very beneficial as well. Uh, so we are always uh, encouraging multidisciplinary and multi-institutional teams. Uh, so being able to make those research connections outside of Penn State would be fantastic. So once you put in those connections, yes, an industry, academia, it doesn't matter. Essentially, anyone that can help could potentially help this team move their idea forward. Uh, because if they don't get our $40,000, they're going to need help. Uh, and what I've found uh, is that the more people you talk to that are working in your space, the better chances you have for getting your ideas uh, brought into reality. Uh, so yes, any sort of connection you can think of 
uh, that would be a, this would be a place to, to recommend it. Once I click on there, you will see that it says are you are almost done. Click one more time to finish your review. You click on that and it says thank you for your time, you are done. You close that and then you click on the link again and you start your review for your next proposal. You'll notice there's a password. Again, the password is coil rig. That's in the email and the instructions. <coughs> Excuse me. And you just simply start the review again. You do that four times over. So that's it. That's the process, beginning to end. Once you have completed all these reviews, uh, I will take them. I will do a statistical analysis of them. I will look for outlying scores, which I define as anything uh, greater than two standard deviations from the mean. I will uh, rank the proposals based on point values with and without outliers, and I will send that back to you the day after proposals are due. Proposals are due, or I'm sorry, reviewer, reviews are due on May 30th by 5 p.m. You will have the uh, the compiled results sent to you by the end of the day, May 31st. Then you'll have a few days to look over those, and on June 2nd we have a reviewer meeting. If you are able to come to that, that is fantastic. If you are not, I understand. Uh, we will have a live stream session if you would want to stream in. Some of you will be asked to represent your proposals at that table. And some of you will be told that you do not need to worry about coming if you're, none of your proposals are within the top 10. Uh, since we're only funding two or three, anything outside of the top 10, uh, it's extremely unlikely that it would be funded. Uh, so to save your time and ours, I'll just let you know that and you do not need to come to the reviewer meeting. That said, there's always a seat at the table for you if you'd like to come, uh, but you will feel, you need to feel no obligation. We'll have the reviewer meeting on June 2nd, and then June 13th, uh, we will announce the final decisions. Uh, we have a director that is out of the country for a week there, so we've got a little bit more of a delay than we normally have. Uh, but by the 13th, you will know, and then I will let the PIs know uh, whether they have been funded or not. That's it. Beginning to end. Uh, are there any other questions as I wrap up? If there are, please type them into the comments. Otherwise, I'll just kind of wrap up this session right now. Uh, I want to thank you one more time for your time, for your attention, uh, for being here, and for being willing to do this. If you have any questions, if you need any help, if you have any concerns, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, all of my information is in the email you, emails you've already received from me. Uh, and I will do anything I can to help you out. Uh, I do not want this to be stressful whatsoever. This should be fun. It is for me. And I'll just say as an aside, reading through these innovations, reading through these ideas is exciting because it gives you this sense of what is going on, the cutting edge of what's going on at Penn State and beyond. And that's really cool. I have a, I have a phenomenal time reading all these proposals. This time we only have 18. We've had 30 in the past, and, and I've, I've ravaged through those uh, even when we've had 30 because there's so much fun to read. Hopefully you'll have the same experience. So with that, thank you so much. Have a great remainder of your day, and uh, I will be talking to you soon through email. Thanks. Bye-bye.